Many of the diseases of old are actually related to some of these or due to some of these microscopic organisms such as the bacteria here that causes salmonella. Bacteria exist everywhere. Close to 40% of the cells that are, make up your body are actually bacteria. And most of those are serve beneficial purposes in helping you digest and these kind of things. But they reproduce and grow so fast, their, their purpose in the, in the creation is to be a decomposer. But if they get in the wrong place, they can try to decompose you as well, right? So that's the reason they cause a lot of problems. But they can grow and bacteria can grow and divide about once every 20 minutes under optimum conditions. And one of the things I always do in my classes every year, I teach biology at a Christian school, is I give my students a petri dish with some growth media in them and have them touch it and then put it in the incubator just so they can see what kind of funk will grow you know after them just touching it and compare that with like toilet water or something so they realize that their hands are actually but you know there's there's microbes everywhere suffice it to say that everywhere we look we can see these microbial organisms any any stagnant droplet of water if there's an, some organic debris there, you go out in, in the curb out there and suck up a little bit of water with a little bit of mud, throw it under a microscope, and you'll see organisms like these in almost any droplet of water that you find out there. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Now, the cell was never known until the advent of the microscope and these kind of things. The, the term itself wasn't coined until 1655. When a researcher by the name of Thomas Hook looked at one of the first microscopes at thin cross sections of cork and he saw these little compartments that to him reminded him of the cells that he had seen in monasteries, like prison cells and stuff. So that's where the word comes from, is actually like the cells in a monastery. But now we know that all organisms are made up of one or more of these little compartments we call cells. The human body has about 100 trillion cells. And you actually make somewhere near a million cells per second. That's a conservative estimate that your body actually makes around a million new cells per second. Those old, new cells replace old cells on a never-ending cycle. More recent advances in microscopy have illustrated something even more magnificent and and I love these images from electron microscopes of which there are more than one kind there's a scanning electron microscope and a transmission electron microscope the scanning electron microscope gives us these images of that show the three-dimensional surface of objects this is a single cell organism called a diatom but these new these microscopes really do illustrate the symmetry and the workmanship that is in the cell. Single cell organisms. The workmanship, huh? Some of these images really do illustrate just how world views affect your interpretation. Forgive me for walking in front of the projector. How can someone see this and not realize that it's a construct? That someone made this? Hmm? How blind must you be by your world view, right? Now, before I show you this next image, I wanted to show you one under an optical microscope. This is a this little single cell organism right here is coating itself with plates. This is a single cell organism. If you see right there, you can see the plates. But he's making these little plates out of calcium carbonate, and he'll then excrete them, and then he coats itself with these plates. And I wanted to show you this so that you would better appreciate what this organism then looks like under the scanning electron microscope which is this single cell organism covered itself in these little calcium carbonate plates, but just an amazing thing. Of course, we know who made these, right? First Colossians, uh, Colossians 1, 16, forgive me. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him, visible and invisible. But there are two worldviews out there, aren't there? Whether you want to call them atheism versus theism, naturalism versus supernaturalism, or evolution versus creation, these are the two worldviews. And a worldview affects how you see things, right? And that's in particular with regard to the cell. Um, worldview definitely affects the way scientists view the cell. Um, Ernest Haeckel, who at the time Darwin published his work, uh, The Origin of Species, um, was pro arguably one of the most popular, the most renowned evolutionist of his day, he described the bacterial cell 
which he named the kingdom Monera this way, not the bacteria, not composed of any organs at all, but consist entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. Nothing more than a shapeless, mobile little lump of mucus or slime, consisting of albuminous combinations of carbon. Nothing more than a shapeless, mobile little lump of mucus or slime. Of course, trying to diminish what then was thought to be a precursor to modern cells, right? The bacterial cell thought to be one step up from organic compounds to the bacterial cell to the cell we, that, that we know that has all these little organelles. They were trying to diminish what it, really, what it really was, but bacterial cells perform all the same functions that other cells perform. They're not simpler, they're just smaller, a lot smaller. But we now know that the cell is extremely complex. Even in comparison to our technological marvels, you know, the, the Boeing 747 has five million moving parts approximately, but the cell itself has billions of moving mo of parts. It's a tremendously complex thing. Um, this is a, actually a picture of a, what we call a eukaryotic cell, which is different from a bacterial cell, which is prokaryote. Prokaryote means before nucleus. And the eukaryote means it has a true nucleus. The nucleus is one of these little organelles. These cells have little organelles, like we have an organ in our body, like the hearts and lungs and things. Cells have these little organelles. They have little compartmentalized processing centers. One of them holds the DNA, that's the nucleus right there. There are other organelles, we'll talk about some of these. The mitochondria is the organelle right there that makes energy for the cell. We'll talk about some of those energy processes, the Golgi involved with processing and packaging cider products. Other things like microtubules are used for structural support and to make things like these little cilia come out here. We'll talk about those some, but cells have all these little organelles. It's a tremendous, tremendously complex thing. But uh, let me see, I'm gonna kick this out, give me something. I'm gonna read you an excerpt from Michael Denton's book, Evolution of Theory and Crisis. Um, I don't recommend a lot, but I, would, I just finished reading this about a week ago. Uh, Michael Denton is an evolutionist who, and this book's about 20 years old, but published a book talking about evolution and the problems with it, the problems that he sees with Darwin's general theory of evolution. But if you haven't read this book, I would consider it at this point required reading. So if you haven't, evolution of theory and crisis, definitely take a look at this. To grasp the reality of life that has now been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. If we were to enter, we would find ourselves in a world of su supreme technology and bewildering complexity. We would see endless, highly organized corridors and conduits branching in every direction. These are these corridors, these conduits that make up uh, the cytos what's called the cytoskeleton and involved with transport of uh, molecules. Branching in every direction away from the perimeter of the cell, some leading to the central memory bank in the nucleus and others to assembly plants and processing units. A huge range of products and raw materials would shed along all of the manifold conduits in a highly ordered fashion to and from all the various assembly plants in the outer regions of the cell. This is a transport protein shuttling a, a vesicle along what's called a microtubule. We would see all around us in every direction uh, robot-like machines. We would notice that the simplest of the functional components of the cell, the protein molecules, were astonishing complex pieces of molecular machinery. We would wonder even more as we watched the strangely purposeful activities of these weird molecules, particularly when we realized that despite our accumulated knowledge of physics and chemistry, the task of designing one such molecular machine that is one single pro functional protein molecule would be completely beyond our capacity at present. What we would be witnessing would be an object resembling an immense automated factory, a factory larger than a city and carrying out almost as many unique functions as all the manufacturing activities of man on earth. However, it would be a factory which would have one capacity not equal to any of our more complex machines for it would be capable of replicating its entire structure within a few hours.